just move on and our next talk is by uh, Professor Fritz Henglein from the University of Copenhagen on synthetic algebraic programming. So, <laughs> Thanks. As I mentioned, I'm the one who is, uh, um, and I hope to share here, um, and um, I, um, I hope you can see, uh, can you see the polyglot, uh, the polywatt paper? Can we see a zoom. You see Zoom, okay, that's not that <laughs> anyone to share. Okay, let me have problems now, since we're in the process, okay. Um, it's still the okay. same? Okay. Perfect. Now you can see it now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I, I, I so, sorry about getting us delayed, and I have done the, the wonderful thing of not carefully checking the program and figuring out that it's a 10 minute slot. So um, please be patient with my 40 minute uh, talk. Anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll rush <laughs> through this a little bit. And um, but there's actually only one thing I wanna do here is, is actually uh, tell you a little bit about the thinking about uh, what, what you know, would be called synthetic you know, um, programming or synthetic mathematics or synthetic um, um, you know, approach to, to programming. So instead of just using existing data types, just say, like, well, you know, let's just see what data types pop up once we look at the properties of, 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 of things. And, and the particular cause here is actually, are we really using the right thing when we're using finite sets, which were introduced by Settle? So um, what is natural? So natural numbers were created um, by uh, other world, the, um, you know, uh, so they're there, but everything else is, is men's work or human's work. Uh, that's what Konica um, said. And that means that, you know, we have integers, rationals, we have p-adding numbers and all kinds of things. So, you know, are these natural or not? So, and the question we can ask is, uh, is a data type natural? And there's basically two, in the sense of Kronika, work at men, work of men, and nowadays this would be work of humans, is, um, you know, is that it's natural because they're, we used to them, right? So we basically construct them from commonly known uh, components. So think of that as, you know, finite sets, you know, that's the settled finite sets. But there's also another way of looking is like, you know, well, we construct these things, you know, um, because we want to have them to have useful properties. So whatever comes out of this one. And so the question I want to raise with you here is, are finite sets as, as a data structure actually natural? So sets and settle, and just to give a little bit of background, which actually <laughs> I don't have to do much of it because it mentioned most of those, is that uh, you know I thought it was fantastic and fascinating to be at NYU because that's the place where finite sets and maps were introduced to programming by um, you know in in the form of the settled programming language. It's one of at least I think at least of three early visionary approaches to programming that uh, you know with bulk abstract data types. So bulk data, you know, big data being processed in a single step, which is very, very useful nowadays. And back then was a real deviation from the Zuse Turing von Neumann programming model, which meant like you program one little tiny amount of bits at a time. And uh, so it was, you know, I think it was like Lisp and APL and Settle as uh, introducing sort of high-level data structures didn't have an obvious mapping to the underlying hardware or not just a reflection of the underlying hardware. They also had some very forward-looking safe, safe and security properties. A, APL and Settle, um, you know, is imperative, but it doesn't have aliasing, which is, you know, uh, the bane of many, many uh, security problems. And um, so in particular, you can't really reason easily about it. You need uh, something like separation logic and very advanced tools. While Lisp actually, basically, you could say, you know, Lisp 1.5 got it wrong um, in, in two ways. So until recently. So, uh, in that sense. So Settle is uh, is a natural way of expressing algorithms. You've seen this before. So Bob Page, my advisor, told me the story showing the algorithms, Cal colleague at Rutgers, this this the algorithm you have in mind? And colleague said, well, yes, that's nice and clear as pseudocode. Now, now I guess somebody has to code it. And Bob Page said, same story as with, with Jack Schwartz. Well, this is the code. It's not pseudocode. So the question I want to raise is the following. So are finite sets natural? And this is the um, analytic way you could say, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, everybody knows sets. It's just, we, it's like using English. Is English natural? I don't know, but everybody uses it. So in that sense, it's natural. Uh, you know, as a language, technically, it's probably not a very natural language, uh, English, I mean, but that's a different story. So, but uh, do they have useful properties? So and this is like, you know, these sets. Well, yes, they do. They form an idempotent monad. Mono, monoid, sorry. So if you take, uh, think of this as union, then it just means that union is at least associative. It has more properties. It has the empty set. And importantly, it is idempotent. So if you take two sets, well, the same set and add it with itself, you get the same set back. So, um, well, you know, if you add additional operations like, uh, you know, 
sorry, like intersection or you know the uh, the Cartesian product, you can do a number of these. Then you get basically a an idempotent semi ring. So just you know um, you know the operations like that. So what's wrong with that? Well, um, so they have nice properties. We saw okay. So it's the free it's the free idempotent monad, which means like you give them the set, you know, and then you know you say like I want to have um, you know the smallest you want to have you know a, a type you could say you know or a universe of values. Then you say like like generating actually all the, for, for every element, um, the single set gives us all the finite sets and they're commutative. Um, but um, there's few idempotent monoids in the wild to express, free, you know, to exploit freeness. So for example, somebody says, oh, very often I have to compute, uh, you know, the cardinality of uh, the union of two sets. Well, that's wonderful. But, you know, that just means that you have to compute the union, you know, into its elements. And, and then, you know, count them up one at a time, one plus one plus one plus one, then you get, I don't know, 27. So, um, and the idempotent simmerings have no subtraction in the sense of additive inverse. So what if you want to have actually a, a not just union, but also deletion, right? So, which means that it should actually satisfy that if you take a, a set R or, you know, this thing R and you subtract uh, S from it, then, you know, you should get T and that should be the case if and only if adding T to S, um, Gives us R. Okay. So that's just the same way of saying it, it would be nice to have an additive um, inverse, you know, something what, subtracting something and then adding it again gives us the original thing. Uh, and it should be ideally possible to do this for all RST, but that's that's not the case. And it turns out actually that it's impossible for an idempotent semi ring or idempotent uh, monoid to actually have deletion in general. So it, it's always a broken form of deletion we need to have. And the reason is this. Because the only idempotent semigroup, you know, semigroup means just, you know, it has these operations before, plus the idempotency, you know, it is only the trivial one. So what do we do now? Okay, so um, you could say, hmm, well, why, why are these algebraic properties actually even good for? You know, it's like, who, who cares about them? Well, it turns out that they're actually quite useful for compositional reasoning about correctness. So if you need to correct reason about, you know, a fragment of a program, it most likely has unresolved identifiers. Otherwise, you have to do it for you know one million lines of code at a time. You need to have the complete context available. So, what if you're looking at this statement? You know, you'd like to actually optimize it to R, right? So it's like R, and then we're subtracting T, and then adding it again. Well, that seems like we can optimize this to R, but is it really true in all contexts? Because if T is not a subset of R, well, this is not equal to R um, in with standard set deletion. So. So this requires arbitrarily hard static analysis for sets. And it's arbitrarily hard because if it doesn't hold for all R, S, and T, as we said before, then this requires static analysis. And any form of semantics-based static analysis is undecidable. So this is like, you know, you're going from trivial, it always holds, to as hard as you want it to be. Also, in transformational programming, you can do as above. You know, you can say, but, um, you know, I'd like to transform this program, developing this, uh, you know, and then I'll replace it by R. But hey, if you don't know whether T is a subset of R or not, well, then it turns out you can't just really rewrite it. You rewrite it. So if it's a subset, T is a subset of R, then you can, you know, just return R for this expression. But otherwise, well, you just have to compute whatever this is. But there's no computational benefit. It's just, you know, you might as well just, you know, compute this in all cases. So and finally, you know, if you have optimized runtime execution by exploiting unconditional algebraic properties, that would be nice to have available. Uh, if it, the, the algebraic properties are unconditional, they don't depend on, you know, conditions on R, S, and T, as we've seen before. For example, the cardinality of, you know, the union of two Cartesian products of, of sets, well, we can compute it like this. Cartesian product, um, uh, cardinality of this, well, we'll just, say that oh that's um that distributes over plus well if only it did it doesn't do so for sets but what if it did if it were basically homomorphism um over plus then you know um another an algebra homomorphism if we could then furthermore which actually even holds for sets uh, we can say like oh to compute the cardinality of the product of two sets we don't need to actually multiply out the set which means like generate the set of all pairs in the case where that Cartesian product is only required to return the cardinality, we just, you know, take the cardinality of one, 
and the card name not. Now we have numbers. They are small. We just multiply them and we're done. But this is not correct if plus is idempotent union. Okay. So checking whether R and S are disjoint every time R plus T is executed is again prohibitive. So the idea now is the following. Okay. Hmm. Let's synthesize a data type from its useful unconditional algebraic properties. So unconditional because we want to use this at runtime. Uh, so don't check whether R and S and T have certain properties. So the idea of one is like idempotence and additive inverse. That's what we're striving for. Well, it doesn't work. So idempotence and additive inverse, as we've seen, they're totally at odds with each other. So can't have both unconditionally. The second thing is like, well, let's keep idempotence and uh, throw out additive inverse. Well, then basic subtraction is broken. And that's that's what the finite sets are that we get. Okay, so but then it means that the computation of intersection is required when we actually use, because that gives us union here, right? Mm -hmm. When the union needs to be computed. So the primitive operation on these sets is actually expensive to implement. And that's the third idea, which we'll try to introduce now, is keep the additive inverse, but throw out the idempotence of plus. So you, this yields actually finite polysets. So they satisfy this prob, you know, property that every R has a, a, an inverse. So R minus R is equal to zero. And in particular, R minus S plus S is always equal to zero, uh, sorry, to R. So these are the properties of, well, they look familiar. So um, that's an abelian co commutative group. So if you would use the commutativity on top of that. So now we actually say like, oh, wait a minute, these, these things we have, well, let's call them finite, if they're finite, polysets. They actually satisfy this uh, property. And in fact, they're actually free. that are completely natural, you could say. So a polyset is um, an element of the free abelian group generated by some type. Oh, that sounds terrible. But it actually intuitively means it's a, a finite map from values. So from a universe of values. So it could be an infinite set. I shouldn't say set, an infinite uh, type of, of values to not the Booleans, which would be a characteristic function that gives us regular sets, and, and not to the natural numbers. That would give us multi-sets, but actually to the integers. And that now all of a sudden means that we have um, finite polysets are the ones that are finite in the sense that an, an only finite number of elements have non-zero multiplicity. And an element can occur in a polyset a negative number of times. Okay, so it can occur minus two times. And if you uh, take the uh, you know, same set with two times occurring, you get the empty set. Kind of strange, you could say. So what are we doing with these things? You know, what for? So polysets are actually quite natural data structures. So, um, so you might say like, I don't know, Polly says, never heard of those. Actually, they're, they're, they pop up in different contexts. So for example, if you have a distributed system and you send messages like delete X, you know, you know, it's like there is some server that maintains information and it gets updated. So for simplicity, assume it just maintains a set, okay? So of values. So, and then the message is like, please delete X and add you know, the element Y to it, okay? But they're being sent on a, on a network without FIFO synchronization, which means that a delete X and an add, well, let's make it sure, and an add X, they might occur in any order. They might arrive in any order, and this is a network property. So it's like, you know, you know if somebody fires off a delete X, somebody else uh, an add X, which comes first? Well, the, reser the server can guarantee, look, you know, if we use polysets, that's what you very often actually want to do is like, you know, you have a negative number of X's can be in there. So if you take a, an empty set and you delete X from it, well, you know, it's been deleted just before it actually was added. Okay. So it's just a reversal of messages. There's transfers in finance and production. You know, you can actually represent lots of things very naturally by saying, oh, okay. A transfer of in, if money is that uh, Alice is mapped to five and Bob is mapped to minus five. So that not accidentally adds up to zero here. So that's kernel space thing, but uh, it represents a transfer from, from Bob to Alice. So notice that, uh, you know, it's quite natural to say like, you know, this is a finite map that, you know, um, uh, where Bob occurs minus five times, you could say. So polysets are these free modules over, over, uh, over the integers also. So before we've defined them as, as groups, but you can naturally, they basically say like, there are just modules. Modules are just, you know, you know uh, ring-like structures um, over, over rings. So this gives us a, a, an efficient representation of iterated addition. So if you want to have S plus S plus S plus S plus S, you know, all of them sets or multi-sets, 
um, you just write them down and you have a uh, 16,000 of those, you just write down 16,000 times S. So very compact representation and very efficient. So uh, they can also be equipped with bilinear operations, you know, is tensor product intersection. This basically means like, you know, it's Cartesian product over sets, generalized polysets and, and intersection intersecting. And their, their implementation is efficient by, by using algebraic runtime space simplification, where we're using at runtime these, these algebraic equalities as unconditional rewritings, as you've seen with the cardinality. So to I'm summarize, sorry. yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just uh, need to interrupt and ask uh, how many more slides because the time's up. <laughs> yes, I'm almost, I'm almost ready. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so polysets, um, so I, I think I've gone for seven minutes now, eight. So I'll uh, I'll try to be uh, short. Um, won't lose the full ten minutes. So uh, so okay. So there is these polysets, and what if I need? I, I I don't like them. Okay, I want my sets. I want my polysets, multisets. Okay, so that's no problem. You know, uh, every every set is just multiplicity zero one. You know, that's a polyset. Every multiset is also zero one two three four five or whatever. That's also polyset. And then if somebody says, oh, I'm sticking you a polyset, they can always sort of like, you know, anything occurs a negative number of times, make it zero. That gives me a multiset. And anything that occurs 16 times or, you know, just, you know, a positive number of times, say that it occurs once. So you have these up, up, uh, projection operations uh, from polysets. You can turn them into multisets and sets. And the key thing is these in implementation terms, these are the expensive parts. So whenever you can get away with just having polysets, there are cheap operations. And if you really, really need the multisets or the sets, then you have to apply explicitly these projections. So just um, to uh, the recipe of the synthetic algebraic programming is like define a big data type and their primitives by useful unconditional algebraic properties and, and these universal properties. So, you know, you have basically all operations you need to express something. And, uh, and then you can, uh, you know, have evaluations rule, evaluation rules like this. It's a symbolic operator, it's a data structure. And whenever you you know have the cardinality function applied to it, it just immediately jumps to this evaluation. Then you add non-algebraic properties, the ones that you like, you know they're expensive, but use them sparingly. So and uh, if you don't like uh, you know so in particularly interesting these ring light structures. So what you can do with them? This is actually a, the last slide. Um, is like you can do efficient data structures and algorithms with worst case optimal query evaluation, even for these famous. Well, you're very hard to treat the cyclic queries. They're extended to infinite sets and fuzzy sets and so on. There's, we can represent infinite sets, uh, so-called compact sets, you know, things like uh, all strings, but Bob, um, you don't have to enumerate only finite sets and you can run programs backwards and for forwards. So this is a way of, um, you know, uh, capturing actually what in algebra would correspond to adjoints. So the adjoint of plus is, is the duplication function. And uh, finally, this is actually an algebraic version of what Stettel cleverly tried by, tr by putting relations in the center, binary relations and saying like, you can run them forwards from x's, from an x to all the y's, and you can run backwards from a y to all the x's. So this is basically what, what adjoints do in linear algebra. So you can generalize this to, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, you, we've mentioned them to Hilbert spaces and then perform symbolic and automatic differentiation, express uh, quantum computing, and uh, in use very efficient data structures for um, for linear maps that are much much better than than uh, matrices in most cases. So and then apply. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh oh, did I say Thank something you. wrong? <laughs> Thank you. I guess uh, we probably have time for a few questions. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, <laughs> Annie that. was looking at me. <laughs> I know how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, we can take him later, you know, because yeah. um, you know. Um, and, uh, I'm yeah, still, uh, I, I guess feel responsible for the delay before. That was, of course, mine, and I would have <laughs> only because I was so curious to hear what uh, Ed actually had to say. So didn't do my job. Uh, I have a question, if I may. Yes. Ik do you think that polysets can be used when the elements of these polysets are variables in the sense that they are not ground? You, you don't know exactly the value of the yes. elements? Yes, and this is actually one of the generalizations is that we have um, um, generalizations to, to so-called sigma modules, which is a way of saying like there can be variables in there, okay? And okay. um, this is a trick actually that a special case of this one gives us the uh, 
having infinite uh, you know um, sets possible. For example, if you want to say I want to get all the five tuples where you know the you know like the first one is one, then two, and then any string, okay, and then uh, three and four, and then the next one is like I want to have seven and nine, and then any string. Um, so you can just basically you know. Uh, Put add them together, and you have and that corresponds to saying I have the sigma, I have the infinite sum over all uh, you know the um, the um, you know tuples that you form formulated when x is in there. Okay. Okay. And if okay. you use the x multiple times, you get some interesting uh, calculi. In particular, you get uh, you get uh, queries that you can run forwards and backwards. You know, like uh, filters and joins okay. and things. Yeah. Thank you. And re represent the result very compactly. Yeah. I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, as a programmer, what would programming in SETA look like if SETA was based on polysets, not on sets? Not much different, actually, um, because uh, the operations are still plus and minus, and you can do additionally things like you know, uh, you know, this kind of scalar product really means like you know. Uh, five times a set. Usually, you wouldn't do that with regular sets because they're uh, idempotent. But you know, if you say like, "Oh, they're multi-sets, like in SQL," or in this case, they're polysets, then you know, you, you want to have that operation too. You know, Cartesian product. You would just the set of all x, y. You know, from x drawn from s and from from y. That's just the tensor product. I mean, if you generalize it, that's just uh, they're available. So these are the corresponding operations. It's Thank just you. like all of a sudden you get it. Sometimes you get a result that's either it's defined, you think it shouldn't be defined, or it's different from, from what you think. Like, for example, you take a, a small set and, uh, you know, subtract a big set from it. OK. And then the result is like, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, it's just a, a negative set. Right. Or a negative poly set. But, no, but a big set. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, yeah. Right. OK, okay thanks. Yeah. Move on. Pardon? Let's move on. <laughs> These are all exciting discussions, right? But if you're going to be here, I think the Europeans has to go to sleep after midnight. Um, but we'll try to actually make up the time. We'll have some break, and maybe it's not even enough, but uh, we'll try. Everybody can. We can actually, by the way, for more discussions, we have in, informal and special people in the program. I will have shared documents. We can have more discussions that's needed. OK, thank you. Great. Thanks. I have to unshare here. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, 